any one member of the Trinity is possible and proper. And on the other hand, the nature of that communion is controlled uh, in us by the revelation in Scripture, uh, which is keyed into the redemptive historical record in the Bible. Um, and so, namely, the revelation in the economy, in the economic trinity of the work of the three persons. So, we can directly pray to the Spirit, Spirit, but generally the pattern is that we come to the Father through the Son for things like the Spirit's, uh, the Spirit has regenerated us, we can be very thankful for that, we can look to the Spirit, look to the Father through the Son to uh, work in us by the Spirit, uh, to comfort us in affliction, as He's our comforter, to sanctify us from indwelling sin, uh, things of that nature. So since these benefits have been purchased by the Son through the design of the Father, we can directly appeal to the Father and the Son for the blessing of the Spirit in these things. So, now, we see both those things. Now, what exactly is going on here? Um, oh, and the, yeah, so anyway. And one thing, too, is worth mentioning is that the persons are undivided, so, so recognition of any one of the members of the Godhead, really, the whole Godhead is involved. So really, you could say, since prayer respects the divine essence, any prayer is directed to all three persons in one sense. And so, um, the distinction here is not an absolute distinction um, where, you know, the one type of prayer is absolutely divided in sort of this radical sense from the other kind, namely the um, kind of respect the economy from the Father through the Son um, by the Spirit and the direct invocation of the one or more of the persons are not absolutely divided. Now, um, Owen describes the Holy Spirit as the spirit of sanctification and the spirit of consolation. He describes him as a spirit of sanctification and of consolation. Now, when he describes the spirit as both these things, um, generally in the first sense, here he's speaking about positional sanctification. Like in Hebrews 10, 14, where it says, By Christ's own offering, he had perfected forever them that were sanctified. There, that's not talking about the progress of becoming holy, but it's talking about the fact that all believers are set apart to God. So Owen, for Owen, and scripturally this is the case, um, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of sanctification to the unregenerate elect in that he changes them from sinful unbelievers into uh, believers. So he removes them from the kingdom of darkness and he sanctifies or separates them into God's kingdom um, from uh, Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of this world. And so there, that's positional sanctification. And the Holy Spirit does that. Apart from the working of the Spirit, no one would come to Christ. And so this is part of his, this work. And of course, this takes place in connection with the Holy Spirit's work of regenerating his people, uh, of regeneration. And so Owen generally, when he speaks of the Spirit as the Spirit of sanctification, he's speaking of the objective legal or forensic, forensic, the legal or forensic work of the Spirit. And when he speaks of the Spirit as the Spirit of consolation, on the other hand, he's generally speaking of the work of the Spirit that is the subjective work in us, the work of making this objective work uh, real to us, you might say, the work of, of actually applying that to us, in us. So he consoles us by <clears throat> showing us, revealing to us, and applying to us the legal um, work that, that the, the salvation that Christ has purchased for us from the decree of the Father. So, though, again, here, this is not an absolute distinction. Um, certainly, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of sanctification in the progressive sanctification of believers also. Um, that is absolutely a supernatural work where the Holy Spirit progressively eradicates indwelling sin and renews us and strengthens us in inner holiness. That is a supernatural work. Like, for example, in Psalm 51, where David says, Create in me a clean heart of God uh, and renew a right spirit within me. Create is the same word used for the creation of the world of nothing. 
There is a creative work in regeneration. There is a miraculous, supernatural, creative action that takes place uh, by the Holy Spirit does in renewing um, a dead sinner. And also, actually, progressive sanctification. God is supernaturally uh, eliminating and transforming the believer, and that is a creative work of Almighty power. Sanctification is absolutely by God's divine power. And so, um, he is uh, both a spirit of sanctification in that sense, too, progressively sanctifying us and consoling us. But Owen generally uses sanctification in um, you know, the book we're talking about, Communion with God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, of that objective forensic legal work. And consolation is the subjective application in his dominant uh, paradigm, in his dominant way of describing things. Now, he does say uh, consolation is something that the Spirit applies to the believer. It is his uh, privilege, it is his blessing in Christ, but he doesn't always console the, people, the believer in exactly the same sense. Sometimes the Spirit is uh, the spirit is sovereign, and he sometimes works in a greater way, and sometimes not as greatly in consoling us. Um, he doesn't always console us to the same extent. Owen explains, and I think that is the case. Now, what does he console us with? Well, he, the consolation is based on our union with Christ and Christ's purchased grace from the love of the Father. And that is what the Spirit comforts and consoles us with. So the Spirit, when he consoles the believer, he fills us up with a recognition, an understanding, a deeper growth in apprehension and application and appropriation of the mediatorial work of Christ. So the Spirit points us to the saving accomplishments of Christ. And that's important because the Holy Spirit's comforting and consoling work needs to be tied, that subjective apprehension of those things uh, needs to be tied in to redemptive history, it needs to be tied in to the economic work of the Trinity toward us. And so uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't just give us some kind of general comfort. The Holy Spirit um, reminds us and makes leads us to appropriate in a greater way the actual redemptive work of Christ and uh, that took place in history. So the Spirit doesn't console us with a vague sense that God loves us. But the Spirit consoles us by reminding us of the concrete facts of redemptive history, of the Father's unbounded and eternal love manifested at the cross, of Jesus' is being crucified in my place and resurrected um, in my, as, my, uh, as, my, as the second Adam, as my covenant head, as uh, of the descent of the Spirit of Pentecost, so that a member of the Godhead is now in us and empowers us of the future coming of Christ when he will bring us to himself. So the Spirit consoles us with these objective truths and facts of Scripture and applies them to us so it enables us to appropriate them to ourselves. And so this is not some sort of just vague general consolation, but a very specific uh, consolation, very specific comfort tied into redemptive history tied into this compelling, glorious story of the triune God's love for his people. Now, Owen ties in the sanctifying, consoling role of the Spirit, the comforting work of the Spirit, to the indwelling of the Spirit. Now, the Spirit actually does literally indwell the believer. And part of the work of the Spirit in his indwelling is this is in order to give us union with Christ through whom we receive all the benefits of the uh, redemptive benefits in the economic trinity. Now, what are the texts, what are some texts that show the Holy Spirit literally indwells believers? Well, for example, Ezekiel 37, 27, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Romans 8, 9, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Um, so the Holy Spirit sent us. Galatians 4, 6. God has sent forth the spirit of his Son to our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
2 Timothy 1 4. That good thing committed unto us, unto thee. Yeah, but it's really 2 Timothy. Yeah, 2 Timothy 1 4. Title there. Maybe it really is a typo. Hmm. That good thing, oh, 2 Timothy 1 14. Not 1 4, 1 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So the Holy Ghost dwelleth in us. This is a literal indwelling. We can see from those passages, the Holy Spirit literally inhabits the believer as his holy temple. And that's important. That is a glorious source of consolation that we, and God wants us to receive that. I'll, I'll quote a moment here. He says, um, the Lord knowing uh, how much of our life and consolation depends on this truth, the truth of the indwelling of the Spirit, redoubles his testimony of it that we might receive it, even we who are dull and slow of heart to believe. So Owen argues both that the Spirit must personally be inside the believer in order to comfort us, and that the believer must actually know and believe that, the, that he has the Spirit uh, for the fullness of that comfort. So we both, both we receive comfort from the actual fact of the indwelling of the Spirit, and we receive comfort as we recognize that he is there and that he is there to comfort us uh, within us. And that is certainly a source of tremendous consolation that the very God of heaven would deign to make us his particular temples and dwell us. Glory to God what, for that wonderful truth. So the consolation and comfort in the, of the gospel comes in part as the believer realizes that God has made himself imminent within us. He is actually so close to us as to actually be in us. And that is a very important truth. Now, um, you can't just reduce, in Owen's day, the Socinians and some other um, heretics try to reduce this uh, fact to just being the Holy Spirit is at work or there's operations of the Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit actually dwelling us. But if you look at the actual texts, the operations and personality of the Spirit are regularly spoken of in distinct comparison with the person and work of the Father and the Son. So the Spirit can't just be another way of saying Father or Son, where um, all three are mentioned in the same breath. Um, so for example, Romans 8.16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So um, he bears witness to uh, that uh, fact. And um, so this uh, Owen said, the spirit that dwells in us bears witness in us, distinct, a distinct witness by himself, distinguished from the testimony of our own spirits are mentioned, is either an act of our natural spirits or a gracious fruit of the spirit of God in our hearts. So um, it isn't just that God um, in different uh, works connected to the indwelling of the spirit, just, it's not just the, that this, just the Father and the Son is working in us, but the Holy Spirit is actually in us, distinctly testifying to us, distinctly testifying to the spirits that we're children of God, distinctly working in us. Uh, all of his comfort, all of his uh, work of applying to us the work of Christ. So, part of our consolation from the Spirit comes because we recognize that the Spirit is actually within me. I actually have the Holy Ghost of God, the, the member of Jehovah, uh, one of the Triune Godhead, or the whole Triune Godhead, so we obviously see, within us. Now, the primary effect of the indwelling of the Spirit, though, is not just, the indwelling of the Spirit is not just to give us comfort in His presence, though He does give us that comfort, but the presence of the Spirit unites the believer to Christ because there is a special union that we have. Our union with Christ is by the Spirit. Now, The, there's, we have a union with the entire Godhead, but only Christ united human nature to himself. And so we have a particular union with the Son based on the fact of his uniting to himself with human nature. And we can, in, in this, there's a, I'm going to explain this. Um, now, this union that we have with Christ is spiritual. The exact nature of it is difficult to exactly define, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy it. There's, uh, Owen said, 
The scripture expresses this union to be very eminent, near, durable, setting out for the most part by similitudes and metaphorical illustrations to lead poor weak creatures into some useful, needful acquaintance with that mystery, whose depths in this life they shall never fathom. So we're never going to fully understand it, but we do have the spirit produces is the, the agent that produces a union with Christ. And uh, we can appreciate that comfort from it, even though we can't fully grasp all that's involved in it. Now, Owen says that the union, the substance of the union that Christ has as a theanthropos, as our mediator, and the union the believer has with the indwelling spirit is similar. He says the spirit doesn't only create the union, but is the union. Christ and the believer are united in the medium of the same spirit they both share. Now, um, I'm going to explain that some more here. Um, so in other words, the believer who is, what, what, what he's saying though, is the believer who is truly indwelt with the personal Holy Spirit can savor the thought the same Holy Spirit is also, in some sense, um, present with the person of Christ as the God-man, uh, the Spirit also indwelling Christ as man. And in so doing, in the fact that the Holy Spirit both indwells the God-man and the Holy Spirit indwells us, that is part of our union with Christ as God and man. Now, um, Scripture speaks and Owen explains there is a threefold indwelling of God in the believer. The Father and the Son, not the Spirit only, are said to be within the regenerate person. And that's important. We do have the entire Godhead in us. Uh, for example, in John, uh, the Bible said, Jesus said that for those who love the Father, we will come unto him and make our vote with him. So the Father and the Son into all the Holy Spirit because they are equally omnipotent and omnipresent. Um, so they're equally omnipresent. The Father and the Son uh, are in, in the believer as well as the Holy Spirit, which makes sense. The essence of God is undivided. Um, so if one person is in the believer, the whole Trinity is in the believer. And so it, it's not accurate to say that only the Holy Spirit is in you, the Father and the Son aren't. That is it's not true. The whole Trinity is in you. For example, Ephesians 2, in addition to the John 14 passage, John passage, I don't remember how exact reference for that, but Ephesians 2.22 makes that point also. Ephesians 2.22 says, in whom, I'll read verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, the Lord Jesus, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So there, believers are a temple of the Lord Christ, and were built together for inhabitation of God, the Father, through the Spirit. So we see all three persons mentioned as indwelling the believer. Or 1 John 3.23 says, Hereby we know that He, Christ, abide within us by the Spirit which He hath given us. So Christ is in us by the Spirit being in us, so, so the different persons are in us. Now, all three persons are in us, but is there a economic, does the economic trinity kind of teach us something about a distinction in this equality. Well, I'm gonna, Thomas Goodwin said, um, the other two persons are said to dwell in us, and the Godhead himself, itself, because the Holy Ghost dwells in us, he being the person that makes entry and takes possession first, in the name of and for the use of the other two, and so bringeth them in. And I think that's the case. Like You can see that in Ephesians 2.22. So the Spirit, you could say, comes in first, as it were, and brings the other two members of the Godhead in with him. So, so uh, even there, in line with the working of the economic trinity and the spirits being the one who directly applies the work of the Father and the Son to us, we can see that uh, the, the Trinitarian indwelling, the indwelling of all three persons, is tied into the economy, the spirits first coming to indwell the believer. So. There's a sense that, uh, I think that's, that's a well put and I, I'm going to read one more time just to make sure you get it. Um, the other two persons are said to dwell in us, and the Godhead itself, because the Holy Ghost dwells in us. He being the person that makes entry, and takes possession first, in the name and for the use of the other two, and so bringeth them in. 
So the spirit, you might say, is the pioneer for the indwelling of the other two persons. Now, there's a connection. Jesus, in Colossians 2, 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we do not have all the fullness of the Godhead in this bodily because we're not, you know, the incarnate Godhead. Uh, excuse me, the incarnate Son, uh, who has, you know, each person has the whole undivided essence. So Christ has the whole undivided essence of him. We don't have that. But, so there's, it's not exactly the same. But, nonetheless, there is a kind of union, there's a distinction between the union that, um, this is hard to explain, I'm trying to think how, 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 how exactly best to put this. You could say, okay, the person of the Son, and therefore the substance of the Godhead himself, dwells personally in the human nature of Christ. So Christ is man, because Christ is man, is one person with the Son, and the Son has the undivided divine essence in full, you can say the entire undivided divine essence dwells in the human nature of Christ. But while in that sense the entire undivided divine essence dwells in the human nature of Christ, at the same time only the Son is incarnate. Only the eternal Word became flesh, John 1.14. So the Son, there's a union that the Son has particularly with the human nature that he united to himself and with um, his redeemed people. And there's also a union that the entire Godhead has with Christ's human nature. Now, we don't have, we are not one person with two natures, but in a certain sense, our union with the entire Godhead is similar to the union that the Holy Spirit had with the human nature of Christ. Christ, as the God-man, was dependent, Christ as our incarnate human mediator, was dependent on the Holy Spirit, was indwelt by the Spirit, the Spirit was given to him without measure, but we have the Spirit by measure, so there's a distinction. But the Spirit was in Christ, and Christ was strengthened by the Spirit, enabled by the Spirit, worked by the Spirit by, that indwelt him as true man. And in the same sense, the believer also is indwelled by the Spirit, and the Spirit strengthens and works in him. So we have, there's a parallel between the way Christ as man was indwelt by the Spirit and the way believers are indwelt by the Spirit. And since the Spirit bring, being in us brings with it, brings with himself the entire Godhead, we have the whole Godhead in us. And in the same way Christ as man being indwelt by the Spirit had the whole of Godhead in himself. John 17, 21 to 23 kind of explains some of this. So I'm going to read here John 17, 21 to 23. So Christ here is praying to the Father as our mediator, as our intercessor. And this is what he says. He's praying for all the elect. And he says that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. What is this oneness that is being talked about? I'm going to read you a quote from Owen. In that regard, Owen says, The union then with him are say he's speaking about the I and them thou and me. Okay? And this is what he says. Um, he says, This union then with him our Savior declares by, or at least illustrates by, 
resemblance unto his union with the Father. Whether this be understood of the union of the divine persons of Father and Son in the Blessed Trinity, the union, I mean, that they have with themselves in their distinct personality, and not their unity of essence, or the union which was between Father and Son as incarnate, it comes all to one as to the declaration that union we have with him. So he says, some people understand this. Now, this is not talking about the union of the three persons in being one in essence. Their unity as possessing the whole undivided divine essence, that's not what it's talking about. But the three persons of the Godhead, the distinct hypostases, the distinct subsistences in the one substance, those three distinct persons are in one another. The Father is in the Son, the Son is the Spirit, the, and uh, the Holy Spirit. They're all in, the three persons are all completely indwelling one another as well. And that's one kind of union, the union that the three persons have in one another as distinct persons is, some people say John Owen is explaining, is comparable to the union believers have with God. And then other people, and I think that's actually what is being talked about here, is um, that uh, it's the union which the Father has with the Son is incarnate. And that's the union that believers have a comparable union to God with the union that the Father has to the Son is incarnate. I think that's what's actually about the second thing. I'll go on quoting over here again. Okay. So, whether this be understood of the union of the divine persons of the Father and Son in the Blessed Trinity, the union I mean that they have with themselves in their distinct personality, and not their unity of essence, or the union which was between Father and Son is incarnate, it comes all to one as the declaration of that union we have with Him. And he goes on and he says, uh, the Spirit is um, called the bond of the Trinity, uh, proceeding from both the other persons, being the love and power of both. He gives that union to the Trinity persons who substrate and ground is the inestimable unity of essence wherein they are one. So that would be uh, if it's the first thing. Though I don't think that's what it is. And there isn't a, a specific thing where it says the Father, and Son, and the bond of the Trinity is, is the Spirit. I'm not sure. I don't see any specific evidence for that scripture. But this is what I think it is. Owen says, or if you take it from the union of the Father with the Son incarnate, it is evident and beyond inquiry or dispute that as the personal union of the divine word and the human nature was by the assumption of that nature into one personal substance with itself. So the person of the Father hath no other union with the human nature of Christ immediately and not by the union of his own nature thereunto in the person of his Son, but what consists in that indwelling of his spirit in all fullness in the man Christ Jesus. Now, saith our Savior, this union I desire that they may have with me, by the dwelling of the same spirit in me and them, whereby I am in them and they in me, as I am one with thee, O Father. I'm going to read that one more time because it's pretty deep, and if you have to go back and listen to the video more than once, I understand. But he says, I speak by the union of the Father with Christ as incarnate, says, um, it is evident and beyond inquiry or dispute that as the personal union of the divine word and the human nature was by the assumption of that nature into one personal substance with itself, so the person of the Father hath no other union with the human nature of Christ immediately and not by the union of his own nature to lie to in the person of the Son, but what consists in that indwelling of his spirit in all fullness in the man Christ Jesus. Now saith our Savior, this union I desire that they may have with me by the dwelling of the same spirit in me and them, whereby I am in them and they in me, as I am one with thee, O Father. So, what he's saying is, the personal union between the Father and the human nature in Christ and history takes place through the indwelling of the spirit. So, the Father is united with the human nature of Christ, by the indwelling of the Spirit, and believers are united to the Father by the indwelling of the Spirit in us as men, in us as people. And that's actually, I think, what is the union being talked about in John 17, how we have the union. So the union that the Father has with Christ as man is comparable to the union we have with the Father uh, by, uh, with us as men, and the union that Christ had with the Father as man was by the indwelling of the Spirit. The union we have with the Father is by the indwelling of the Spirit. 
and there's a comparison. Christ had it to the uttermost extent, which we don't, but that's the comparison, and I think Owen is, is correct about that. So the believer can actually, and which is this is an amazing fact, that uh, the son's uh, union here with the father is common.